Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Well, thank you, Dan Hurst. We are here in beautiful Denver, Colorado with my dear friend, Mark Halleck. Hey, hey, bud. Mark, you've got a... You got a sweatshirt on that says "Small Listen, Town Pastors." Small Town Pastors. Are you? Have you ever heard of this ministry? I've never heard of that. Man, they do great work. I met the guy at uh, actually at a conference with Brandon Moore, uh, Resound Network in Missouri. In Missouri, Missouri yeah. Baptist doing great work there. And uh, Small Town Pastors, check it out, man. They are doing great work. Their heart is just that: it's to care for and encourage pastors in small communities. Well, I'm a small town pastor. You bet. Well, now you, you need a sweatshirt. I need man. a sweatshirt. You need to get one of these. Four hundred people in our you town. Check it out. Yeah, they exist for you, pal. Welcome to the Revitalize and Replant podcast. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday. As long as it doesn't rain or snow, we will be here. And then on Fridays, (laughs) we have a special guest every Friday. Glad to have you with us. Again, we're doing this one live from Denver. Listen, we do these things live, right, Halleck? We do them live, man. We are are here in the room together. And you can just pull up a chair and join Mark and Dan and I. That's right. As we sit here in his church, right in his beautiful sanctuary, built in 19, probably 50. Yep. Something like yep. that. Yep. yep. Looks like every 1950s it Southern does. Baptist church you've ever been to. You bet. Long and narrow. <laughs> got those wood beams, those arch shaped wood beams. And, uh, but it's a beautiful place because God's here. Amen. That's and right. It's a wonderful He's church. So we are here at Calvary yep. Church in yep. Inglewood, Colorado. Today we are going to handle the topic, address the question, deal with the issue of why is my church declining? And, um, Man, I'll tell you what, dude, every day I encounter guys on media, Facebook, social media, on phone calls, personal, personal meetings with them, and their churches are declining. And there's some of you who are really, really struggling. Mm-hmm. And so today we're going to give you about four or five reasons overall that if these things are in your church, you're probably going to be in decline. And, and we'll give you also some ways to address those. Um, Mark, give us the first one there. Let's look at the first one. And the first one is pretty obvious, but uh, we need to talk about it. Number one is churches uh, with a majority of older people. That's just how it is. Now, there ain't nothing wrong with being old. Because there's really nothing you can do about it. You're I've a, tried. You are a beautiful old man. I, oh. I mean, that, listen, that beard is just incredible. Couldn't be whiter. I love it. It does look pretty white. You know, I went to get some new glasses the other day and I uh, picked some out. And I thought, well, you know what? I don't really look at my glasses a lot. My <laughs> wife looks at my glasses a lot. So I said, hun, come by here and take a look at these. So she drove over to the, to the optometrist and I put the glasses on and she said, there is no way. There is absolutely. <laughs> they were perfectly round um, wire frames. And she said, dude, <laughs> you look just like Santa Claus, man. I can't look at you like that. I go, but they look so cool. She said, you look like Santa. I said, they look hipster. She said, not on you. You look like Santa. So, yeah, I'm an old man. I can't help being an old man. I've tried to stop it, and you can't stop it. So there's nothing wrong being old. But if the majority of your congregation is old, your church is probably going to be in decline. When you go into churches that are primarily 70 plus. Yeah. What, why, how do churches end up there? Like what, what do you, what do you see? Well, what are some of the things that have taken root? The, in the honest answer to that is that um, they love, they love the Lord. They love Bible study. They love to study the word. They love each other. They love the local churches. They experience it. But at some point, their compassion and brokenness for the lostness of their community took a back seat. Mm. And they didn't make decisions they should have made that had made that church a place where young people could flourish or, or they made decisions that made it feel like a place mm-hmm. where young people couldn't. They have to own the fact that if we're a church of nothing but 75 year old people, yeah. what have we done to make this place a place mm. where young people can't feel? Wow. And it doesn't mean that young people don't feel welcome. They all say we want young people here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But we don't want young people to change anything. Yes. We, right. we, we want to keep it like it is because we like it like we have it. Yeah. And I think what we have to understand is when you get to be my age, you know, our life is a vapor and a fog and I'm like a flu season from heaven. Mm. And so I have to really make sure that my passion is to give the gospel to the next generation and to have yeah. them embrace it and to run with it and, and create on ramps for them. Because really, if the Lord tarries 20 years from now after I'm in heaven, 
it's going to be a lot harder for that 20-year-old mm. who's going to be 40 to live a, a life faithful to Christ in his culture than it was in my culture. Mm, wow. And so I think older people, we, we just get to where we like things the way we like them, and the compassion and brokenness. You know, when Jesus, when Jesus spoke to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 1, he said, man, I know your toil. You're, you suffer for my name's sake. You work hard for me. You won't bear false doctrine. That's every old dying church mm, I've ever been mm-hmm. to. They work hard, they've yeah. toiled a long time, they won't bear false teaching. But then Jesus says, the one thing I have against you, mm. remember how far you've fallen, return to those things you did at first, and, you know, and repent and return yeah. to those things you did at first. Well, why did they do it first? Well, in the, book, in the book of Acts, the church at Ephesus caused a riot because it said everybody in the region knew the way. Mm. So Jesus is saying the things you did at first, you risk your safety, your yeah. job, yep. imprisonment. Because if you start a riot in a Roman province, you're, you're <laughs> going to get in trouble. You risk all of that because people want, you wanted people to know the gospel. Mm. That, they lost that. Yeah. And I think older churches, they lose that. Yeah. There's no other way. Because young people will go to church, they just won't go to your church. Wow, wow. And so yeah. you have to it's really true. do it. it we don't like change when we get older. We like yep. things to be the same. We, we, like, we like to have consistency because there's nothing consistent in our lives at that point. You know, our kids have moved away. Yep. We got all kinds of doctor's appointments. We don't know how to use a phone. We don't know how to find a TV station anymore because it's all kinds of weird apps. <laughs> I can't even drive a car anymore because I have no place to put the key in it. You have to punch a button. And it's like everything's weird, but my, my church is not weird. It's exactly like it's yeah, always been. That's right. That's and right. Satan has made that an idol. Yep. And uh, we have to get them to embrace a higher joy than that joy. So, and if you're a pastor, I mean, there's a lot of pastoral implications in how you lead older people people. I think one of the things as you're talking is the importance of, first of all, valuing them for who they are, yep. recognizing this, you're walking into a, a church that has a long history yep. and you need to respect that. You need to understand and hear the stories. And because if you don't lovingly win the hearts of these folks, they're not going to follow you anywhere. Right. And so I see sometimes young guys who want to make crazy changes way too fast. And I think what you've got to do is you've got to become their pastor first right, right. and love them well, lead with the word, let the word, let the Bible be the bad guy, right? Just preach the word. These are folks who love the Bible. Um, let the Bible be the authority and help them to see by the, by the grace of, of God and the power of the spirit that this isn't their church either. This is the Lord's church. Right. And there are lost in the community that need Jesus. So with very few exceptions, if you have a church that's predominantly older people, it's going to eventually be in decline. The few exceptions might be if you have a church in Sun City or someplace that's a totally retirement community. Mm. Well, that's a little bit different. Yeah. But in normal settings, uh, if it's primarily older people, that's a warning sign and you need to do something about it. Uh, number two... It's a church that focuses major emphasis on minor issues. Oh, boy. <laughs> I want to hear you just talk about well, this Well, you know, when Paul's talking to Timothy in 1 Timothy, he says, you know, remain at Ephesus. He teach sound doctrine. Basically, they're all messed up over myths and genealogies that have no, no answer, you know, yeah. but, but cause division. And so uh, focusing on minor issues is really like taking the bylaws to a level of uh, uh, that you fight over them. Yeah. And, you know, things and we say it all the time, but it is true. Like, do we put carpet in? When do we yep. change the paint? Yep. Do yep. we remodel the kitchen? Uh, you know, do we let another congregation use our building? And that's not really a minor issue. Yeah. But if the idea is that we, we focus on these things that don't have any impact on discipleship, yeah. don't have any impact on lostness of the community. We use all of our emotion and our energy and our time on stuff that have that a hundred years from now won't make any difference. Probably five years yeah, from now that's won't right. make any that's difference. That's exactly right. That's I, right. When I was at, at Warnell, Road in Kansas City. Again, we've said this beautiful, architectural, gorgeous church that at one time was the most wealthy church in the city. And the beautiful interior was gorgeous. But um, it's, I can tell the story because it happened back in the 60s. So everybody's gone now that was part of it. But the, some one wealthy member had gone over to Europe, Italy or someplace. And anyway, he found some beautiful stained glass stuff and had it made up, something like that. Anyway, came back and they had, had this beautiful stained glass uh, thing built behind the baptistry that was backlit, okay? It looks supposed to look like a river. It was, it was pretty. But the colors were not like the colors of the rest of the, congr- rest of the building. They didn't really match the building. And so the, one of the pastor's wives, the former pastor's wife, she told me this story one day. The church was big. It was about five, 600 people, very wealthy people in Kansas City. And um, 
it caused a huge fight because about half the church didn't think that the stained glass behind the baptistry fit the culture of the building. Mm -hmm. The other half thought it was gorgeous and the guy had paid a lot of money for it. And she said, we had to have several meetings on this. And finally, we worked out an agreement that the entire time my husband was pastor there, we, we rotated. One Sunday, the baptistry door would be closed. One Sunday would be open. One Sunday would be closed. Oh, one Sunday. Word. This was one of the largest churches in the city. Wow. One of the most powerfully wealthy churches in the yeah, city yeah. who were focusing on, does that look good or That's not? That's incredible. Oh. Now, needless to say, fast forward 40 years and that church was down to 18 people. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And out of money. Hmm. I think when churches begin to focus major emphasis on minor issues, you yeah. see that happening. On the other hand, if you talk about church plants, man, sometimes they'll be able to pivot mm -hmm. quick, make decisions quick and move quick mm -hmm. and not focus on those minor issues. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And some of us are church governance. Yep. Our church governance that we have creates an environment where everybody feels like they're supposed to have a voice in everything. Yeah. And the most carnal church member can stop anything. The most yeah. pray, unprayed up church member can halt anything in a business meeting. That's how you end up focusing um, major emphasis on minor issues. Yeah. Well, can we can we flip that real quick? So what are what should we be focusing on? Just in the positive. OK, if, if we focus on if churches are focused oh, on we minor should things. be focusing on what is our ministry footprint in the community? Yes. We should wake yes. up every day and say, is this community noticeably better because our church Amen. is here? Amen. And if it's not, that's a crisis. That's right. How do we address this? Yep. How do we start meeting needs? How do we start being Jesus in the community? How do we start being generous in the community? How many people's lives are we interacting with mm. this week in this community who don't know Christ and who don't come to our church? I love it. That's worth getting upset yes, about. Yes, amen. That's the color right. of the baptistry painting is not is worth not. getting upset that's about. That's exactly right. So that's what we're talking that's about. That's so good, man. That's so good. Let's go to number three. So why is my church declining? Let's just review churches with the majority of older people, number one. Secondly, churches that focus on minor issues. And then number three, churches that do not impact or invest in their community. That's exactly what I said. That's right. You got so many churches that people drive to the church, they park in the parking lot, they come in, they have their religious activities, they get back in the car and they drive home. Mm. And sometimes they even put a chain across the parking lot and lock, you know, because <laughs> I get it, they don't want semis on there. Or, have you seen that? Have oh, you, I've seen it. That, I, you know, and because I talk about it all the time, people send me pictures of it, you know. So uh, hold on real quick. I'm just fascinated by this. So they literally put a chain up. Yeah, across so the So that you lot. can't get into the parking exactly. lot? Exactly. And a lot of times it's because they say they don't want trucks turning around in there. They want, because it hurts the asphalt. Okay, okay. Or they don't want um, in anybody parking in there overnight, maybe having some sort of a um, a crime that might oh, take yeah. place, and they would have some liability for them parking uh, okay, there overnight. Okay, gotcha. Okay. You know, maybe it's a high crime neighborhood, all those kinds of things. But my point is, okay, all those things may be yeah. legit, <laughs> but the reality is uh, six days a week the, con the, the community drives by and sees a church with a padlock on their parking lot. That's right. And on Sunday morning, it's like, hey, we love you. Come on in. I mean, Seriously. I don't care what you say. That's oh, a mixed signal, that's right? A mix signal. That's a mixed that's signal. That's exactly right. So, you know, sometimes they go that far. But basically, you know, does the community feel like the yeah. church is there for them? That's right. And if, if the church were to go away tomorrow, would anybody other than the church members care? Yeah. And if, if yeah. no one in the community would care, then you have failed. Yeah. You know, at our little church in Linwood, I mean, the school, the city, if we were to go away tomorrow, they would realize the quality of life for the people who live mm. in Linwood would be drastically yeah. reduced because it, our little church is about 40 or 60 people, but our our community had is 400 people. It really mm. had nothing going on. And so we started doing some community street fairs. All right? I did a couple of them with some music and stuff. They went really well. So the city asked us, would you like, could you do one every, like the first Friday night of every month wow. in the spring and the summer? And so the first Friday night of every month, our church organizes a, a downtown, they close the downtown Main Street. We bring in some band from someplace. We have some food trucks and some bounce houses, and we just do that for the wow. city. I love that. Now, you know, we also put on the Christmas deal at Christmas for the city, all that kind of stuff. My point is, you know, I'm not, if, if our church went away, folks who don't go to church would say, something we're missing something in our community let me ask you this so somebody's listening and they're going man i love all this i love the idea of, of impacting investing in our community but where do we start like what could we do even right now we've never really done much of that before what would be just a few ideas maybe based on what you've you've done um in the past i know warnell i mean you had quite an impact with the, the high school there I right think. but like what would be a couple simple things sure first of all Find out 
what Facebook community your your town has or your neighborhood has. Every town, every community has some sort of Facebook community, right? Sign up for that and then take some time and look at those posts and see what kind of needs, concerns, anxieties people have in your town, right? Yeah. And then just pray through that. That's say, Lord, good. is there something here our church can run to? Is there an issue here we can solve? We, we saw on Facebook, you know, this one guy said, you know, my wife had surgery. She's coming home. Um, she's in a wheelchair. Could someone help us build a ramp? I mean, that's a, that's a no brainer, yeah. right? Right. Immediately right. we get on Facebook and go, hey, we'll come over and we'll, I love we'll that. do that. That's for awesome. You. So that's, yeah. do that. Don't, don't look for really tough things. Yeah. The other thing we did, we went door to door in a small town you can do this and we hung a, a, a bag with some homemade cookies and treats on it and also a little card that said we know life can be hard we pray every Wednesday night we'd like to pray for you mm. and you can fill this card out and drop it in our mailbox at church or you can go online and give us your prayer request and some people did it that was a start wow. the other thing I showed up my, myself or one of our pastors showed up initially at every city council meeting mm. and we would just listen to the city council any problem like when they wanted to do a Christmas program they had really no money to do that they were going to have a mayor's Christmas tree for the first time ever and uh, um, so I, we just said, hey, would you like us to put on a, a celebration to light the mayor's Christmas tree? Well, that would be great. Well, so then we started doing that. Mm. So you don't have to and you don't have to do huge things. Yeah. Just start small. Go to that. the rest home in your neighborhood and, mm-hmm. and, and visit those folks. Stop by the firehouse and take some donuts to the firemen. Uh, let them know you're praying for them and you care about them. Every every couple of years, uh, every twice a year, we have a, a dinner at our church and we invite all of the city workers and the volunteers in the mm. city and the volunteer firemen and their wives. And we just celebrate them, give them a great barbecue meal and maybe some music entertainment and just say, we just love what you do. I love that, You just man. start doing that and then doors begin to open. That's so great. That's so great. I love that. Try to get a couple little wins under your belt. You don't have to do something crazy. Right. Well, this is, uh, this leads to number four. This is our last one. And why is my church declining? Is churches that develop a pattern of I inflexibility. Think, inflexibility. Right. Churches inflexibility. that are just not flexible at all. Yeah. Uh, if your church is church mainly of older people, if your church is a church that focuses on minor issues, if your church has little investment or impact on their community, and if your church has a pattern of inflexibility, you're going to be in decline. If you have really any of those, but certainly if you have all of those. And, you know, what does inflexibility look like? Well, it looks like we've never done it that way, Mm -hmm. or we did Mm -hmm. it one time and it didn't work, or uh, there's too many reasons we can't do this, or, you know, when, when, <laughs> when Moses sent the spies into the promised land, they came back and they gave a report that says everything God said it was, it was. Mm-hmm. And here's even some fruit of it. And it's even greater than we thought it would be. Yeah. But 10 of the spies said, but here's the, all the reasons it can't be done. <laughs> you know, the cities are walled. The people yeah. are strong. We're not, you know, we'll be devoured. And so there's this pattern of inflexibility that says we just can't do mm-hmm. that. Whereas Joshua and Caleb said we should go up at once and take possession for we'll surely overcome it. Flexibility says we've never done it before, but God's told us mm-hmm. we can do it. We can just go do it. Yeah. And again, how do you do that? You mm-hmm. mentioned it a moment ago. You mm-hmm. begin with little things mm-hmm. and you celebrate little victories. You don't begin with the biggie because right. they're not going to go for that. That's right. Yep. But try to do some small things, yep. you know, start nibbling at the edges, yep. some things they'll let you do and then celebrate those yes. and try to develop a culture of flexibility. Yes. Uh, where they're more flexible and, you know, Sometimes if you just move a picture off of a wall, mm-hmm. people will freak out. Yeah, that's Or if right. you move a plant off of the platform, people yeah. will freak out. Yeah. Or if normally your baptistry is open and there's a painting there, but you're going to close the curtain and not have the painting be seen, people might freak. That's inflexibility. Yeah. And it, yep. it really is a problem because we have to be able to really serve on the balls of our feet, ready yeah. to pivot and move to wherever God is working that's at any right. time. That's right. So I would suggest you do two things. You ready? Do experiencing God. Richard and his son wrote a new a new version of that with new videos. It's very updated. Do experiencing God because that helps people realize I have to see where God's at work. And I have to make adjustments to follow him in that work because experiencing God will teach your church. You cannot stay where you are and go where God wants you mm. to go. And then secondly, if you want to follow that up with the Blackaby series, Flickering Lamps, Christ's presence in his church. Yeah. Because people have to understand this is not their church. It belongs to Jesus. And it's not what do I want to do with my church, but what does Jesus want me to do 
with his church. That's so good, man. All right. Well, great job. So let me just review again. Why is my church declining? Churches with the majority of older people. We've talked about that. Churches that focus on minor issues. Churches that do not impact or invest in their community. And then fourthly, churches that develop a pattern of inflexibility. And so you really have to see each of those as the problem that they are and develop ways to, uh, to really combat them and overcome them. And don't try to do it all in one month. All in one year. <laughs> You're not there on a mission trip, it's not gonna man. Work. Yeah, that's You're right. not going to go home in two weeks. I mean, <laughs> take your time. A marathon, not a sprint. That's right. Be patient and let the Lord work through you. Don't preach, try to do it yourself. Preach, pray, love, and stay. Preach, pray, love, and stay. I like that. That's right. I like that. Hey, I just got a text from my wife. What she I say? said, honey, I'm going to be home tonight. Can I take you to dinner? She said, can we eat at home? So there we go. <laughs> I guess that means no. I can't take you to dinner. It's the nicest way I've ever heard a guy gets shot down. I don't want to go out to eat. (laughs) Anyway, so I'll be eating at home tonight. All right, guys. Hey, Dan, take us away. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.